So women of all kinds join together. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned the Working Women's League. We know they also do it in the Working Women's Society, right. which is founded a decade or so right. later. Right, right. But wh why cross-class alliances? Right. Why, why do upper women, upper class women right. care what right. happens right. to poor that, women? That, it's a, that's a great question. And I think that one of the reasons that the upper class women were so interested in this is that they saw working class women as being particularly exploited. They tended to be women who were interested in pushing for gender equality, and they saw that working women were suffering more than they were. At the same time, I think they felt a sort of kinship with working women because many of them, even if they were upper class, their class status was always related to their family relationships. So even if a woman grew up in very comfortable circumstances, if her father died or if her husband died, the family could have a sort of reversal of fortunes mm -hmm. in which that woman would be, in the language of the time, cast upon her own resources and have to try to figure out how to make a living. So I think that that experience of sort of class insecurity made these upper class women kind of attuned to the struggles mm. of working class women. That's fascinating. And do you think it also might have some relationship to the sense of what a family means to the nation at large? So I'm thinking back again to the abolitionist women who felt a kind of kinship with enslaved women because they felt that enslaved women mm -hmm. were being deprived of the capacity to mother their children in part. So here we have these middle-income and prosperous women who also see wage-earning poor women unable to mother, or is that stretching it too far? I think what they see is that the idea of protection is sort of a fiction for all women. There was this idea that women were protected by men, that they were protected by family relationships. That goes back again to the antebellum period, to the domestic ideal that women were protected, and this meant that women were safe within households, that they would be politically represented by men. I think that even some upper class women, especially those that are interested in women's rights, start to see protection as a kind of fiction that is disempowering women politically. And they also, but they don't totally reject the idea. They think the women that actually need some protection are maybe some of these working women. And that leads them to advocate um, protective labor legislation. So I really think that what they're doing is they're sort of reconfiguring protection. They're trying to figure out um, what protection means. They're seeing that it's not really working in a lot of instances. They're worried about the conditions of working women and they want to make them better, but they also want to start asserting a new idea of women's freedom at the same time. Mm. Were these uh, upper class women, we might call them allies, uh, were they concerned about the fact that wage earning women often couldn't make it on their own wages and so they had to resort to what we might call prostitution in order to make ends meet? Well, prostitution was kind of a continual threat that seemed to hang over the problem of women's work. Fears of prostitution actually motivated some of the early labor investigations and early attempts at reform. But one of the things that's really interesting to me is the ways that working class women themselves actually sort of appropriated this language of a threat of prostitution to argue that their conditions needed to be improved. And I think specifically here about Lenora Berry, who was the leading woman in the Knights of Labor. And she would invoke prostitution all the time, but basically she would invoke prostitution to 
lecture to male members of the Knights of Labor and say, listen, you need to include women in your labor organization or this is what they're going to be reduced to. This is what your daughters will be reduced to prostitution unless they can be organized and unless we can really make a fight for them to earn equal wages. It reminds me that one of Lenora Barry's uh, friends or a person who became her friend was Maud Nathan. Mm -hmm. And Maud Nathan was part of a larger group of women who of middle class or elite or upper class women who joined with other women to uh, help working women. Can you talk a little bit about what they did? Yes, and that's a really interesting aspect of the night, starting with the Knights of Labor, that they had this emphasis not just on organizing producers, but also organizing consumers. And so they were very strong advocates of a union label showing that goods had been made um, with workers who were organized. And this is something that the Consumers League actually picks up from the Knights of Labor. They pick up this idea that if goods are labeled, that is a way that might enable women to shop ethically. And I think that's the real innovation that you see with people like Maud Nathan or Helen Campbell, for example, or even Florence Kelly, that they pick up on this idea that upper class women can help working class women by shopping ethically. It's fascinating. So consumers unite with producers mm -hmm. in the case of women. If you consume intelligently, you can help the women who are producing to live better lives. Right. And we'll talk a little more about that when we get to the National Consumers League, which doesn't emerge until a bit later.